Um, I, a lot of things in my life were making me cast my memory back to my teenage years. And I actually was looking back on those years with a lot more like sympathy and um, uh, kind of more of a global um, perspective on it. I was just like, oh, I really was trying as, as hard as I could. Um, anyway, I just wanted to, Kate, to take that empathy that I felt for my teenage self and you know, use it as a lens through which to view this cast of characters, you know, and I wanted to just really honor the coming of age moment, adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, and to do that, I wanted to, you know, make sure that I was emphasizing that it's an intense time, that it is a um, volatile time, that it is full of extremes, and that there are life and death stakes to it. Um, so I thought, what better environment that to put these young women on uh, than an island, a deserted island, which would, you know, be a metaphor for adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, wild, beautiful, scary, um, you know, the whole package, everything that comes at you uh, during that period in your life. Um, so that was the impetus behind it. Nice. And Amy, I know that you're a writer, EP, and the showrunner for season two of The Wilds. Um, how hard was it to create these different characters with the guys? I think Sarah and I really took, um, just wanted to take the same care that she had taken in creating the women characters. So we spent a lot of time before we even started talking about story and what these uh, young men could go through, really crafting detailed, uh, really deep versions of these male characters so that we could use their stories to honor the male coming of age experience the way that we had done in the first season as well. So I think, you know, we looked at, I have my nephew's roommate in college, uh, had a very similar story to Roth's in that he went from Tijuana every day to San Diego to school. Um, they're not personally, their personalities aren't similar, but that was something mm -hmm. we were very interested in exploring. And we, I think what Sarah does so beautifully and what we really tried to focus on always was just really drilling down into the details of who these people were. Um, and then story comes from that because you really start understanding. I mean, one of the, my favorite things is when Sarah came to me and said, I, I want this character to have an Instagram account like we rate dogs, but it'll be this. And I was like, oh, I know, like, great. You've told me exactly who you want this guy to be. Like it, all these like rich details kind of just, I think, bring out what you can do with the characters in terms of story. Yeah, and Sarah, I wanted to ask you, do you see yourself in any of the characters? All of, all of them to a certain degree. <laughs> I think that that's, you know, not to philosophize about the writing process or whatever, um, but I think you sort of have to, like you have to import little parts of yourself. You know, I when talking about the women, I often say that I'm a Leah slash Rachel because I'm, mm -hmm like very ambitious and hard charging like Rachel was in the first season, just very like, I wanna be the best. Um, and then also Leah who is, you know, has a ruminative mind and is always, gears are always turning. Um, uh, so uh, definitely that, but I, really all of them, you just have to kind of excise parts of yourself and put them in the character, in the dialogue um, yeah. to come to life. Yeah, and Amy? Um, yeah, I think, I think actually Sarah said it perfectly. Like you have to find something in all of those in each character that kind of speaks to something inside of you so that you can bring a lot of truth to it. Um, I think to some degree, like I'm a fatten and that I'll say anything to people and I don't, um, hold back. Um, I'm not like fatten in some other ways. <laughs> Um, uh, and I think obviously Aaliyah, who is kind of constantly thinking and worrying, um, I think she's sort of, uh, for me, a very, uh, the very vulnerable parts of myself that I have tried to kind of uh, wall off with a fattened dot uh, sturdiness. So I yes. think those are my, my, my troika. Uh, more of that conflict, more of that um, that 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 moral um, 
um, um, that moral conflict that he's dealing with um, as far as what Rachel is bringing to the table and her views and her her desire to bring this 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 um, um, her vision to light. Um, but the way it's it's affecting now the boys, how, how it affected the girls. Um, me having children of my own, you know, I bring that into my character. And, you know, he's morally conflicted over the overall good of her vision and the cracks and um, that it's sustaining and how it's how it's it's filtering into these characters of these girls. So being empathetic is still there and more so in season two. Well, the struggle. I mean, he he walks the line of uh, of, of of gathering data and information, and also treating these subjects as human beings. Um, I think you start to see some of, of of Dan's real struggle, and what are we really doing here, and at what cost? Um, I think initially it's, it's, you know, screw the cost. We have information we need to get. And now you start to see that like, oh, maybe the person that's behind all this um, might not have the best interest uh, of these kids in mind. And now what do you do with that dynamic? I mean, the power dynamic is really interesting in this case because it working for a woman who we both feel is, um, you know, in this for the good, we learn early on in season one that maybe it might not be for the good, but we have a whole other control group that we need to learn something from. So the struggle of pushing forward, um, regardless of the cons uh, the consequences. Yeah. And is there anything that you've done differently to prepare for this role than from season one? Um, you know what? It's just having more patience because it's more of a cast. Um, and just watching these kids come to the table, um, putting their best foot forward and doing good work. Um, no egos. Um, you would think that with the success of season one, they would kind of come in with a little, little pep in their step, but it was still humble and still um, ready and to eat up knowledge and to, to, to absorb what season two is going to bring, especially sharing the screen with a whole new set of castmates, you know, um, and being mature enough to understand that it's 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 a collaborative effort and it's just forwarding the show to bigger and greater heights. So I think that, you know, the boys coming in were very humble. Um, I think they were a little nervous because they were already, you know, coming on to a, a locomotive right. and, um, you know, but they handled themselves well with dignity and respect and, and, they, and they gave that to the original cast as well you know so and now they're family so and i'm excited for them to see their work from season two in terms of martha she finally like confronts like her own feelings and what's been haunting her her life since like her traumatic incident has happened and uh she really tries to conquer it but you'll see like she has downfalls and falls into a state and I'm, just, I'm excited for everyone to see that. Dot kind of Dot stumbles a little bit she kind of she finally kind of is able to have these moments of of weakness which I think she hasn't really allowed herself um but yet even that in itself can be harmful to the people around her. But something that she's learning this season is she's allowed to be cared for, finally. You know, the, the baton's been passed um, and she's finally able to, to be a little bit free and take, she has people to support her and take some of that pressure for her as well. And now she finally like isn't alone in herself all the time. Um, Batten, it, yeah, she, you can expect a lot of growth from Batten. Um, and uh and and you know she's really graceful about it which is mm -hmm. i like I, I i'll applaud her on that um yeah she doesn't really like question herself too much or mm -hmm. where she's at i mean so much we sort of meet her and she's she's at peace with herself and she's just i don't know she's really she's calmed down a lot and it's really beautiful to see but it's um you know she faces some new 
struggles internally and um, questions that she has to ask herself and face. And um, yeah, it's really challenging, but it's also really beautiful watching someone kind of learning to come into themselves and in, in, in its entirety and you mm -hmm. know grow up essentially is what these women are doing. Um, we see Shelby that as like the happiest we've ever seen her at the beginning of season two. It is like such a breath of fresh air for her, I'm I'm sure. Um there are, you know, Shelby carries around a lot of shame and guilt and tries to expel that in kind of damaging ways. Um, and even though she her and Tony are together and they are perfect for each other, it's um that's that it creeps up in her, you know, that's something that she's going to be dealing with for a really long time. I think, I think that's something that she's trying to resolve, but she's definitely in a completely different space this season. We see her at, with Tony and they're happy and it's really nice to see. Um, throughout the season, you're going to see her evolve um, and really come into just who she really is, not who she's kind of um, been made to be through her diving experience and trying to make it in that sport. Um, but you definitely start off seeing her go through a lot of trauma um, in the first episode. She really had to hit a low in season two um, and recalibrate. And I think that recalibration is a, a different journey than people are used to seeing um, Leah have. And it's interesting to see her go there in order for her to get to the post-rescue, to the person that we see in the post-rescue facility. Um, yeah, I think it's learning her own mind and the limitations that, that it has. Uh, Bo comes from a hard childhood. Uh, he comes from kind of a broken home. Um, and uh, he doesn't really know sort of what to do with his life. But the one thing that he does know is that he's going to stick beside his best friend no matter what. They've been friends since they were little kids. And he doesn't know anything else except just stick with him and everything will turn out all right. Um, Scotty, I play Scotty. I'm Reed. <laughs> I play Scotty. Uh, and, you know, he's a young entrepreneur, but one of the main things the reason why he's a young entrepreneur and is always after money is, is so that he can take care of himself, his family, his best friend, you know what I mean? Um, and people like that, I think, have a hard time in situations where they're surrounded by a bunch of other people because, you know, I think that in the beginning, Scotty's whole idea with mentality was like, all right, so what do I got to do to make sure that me and Bo are good? You know, mm -hmm. I'm not worried about anybody else, but it, you can't always do that in, in every situation, you know, and, and so I, I think, but, but, but that loyalty still stands and that's mm -hmm. one of the, you know, wonderful things about having a best friend um, in any situation. Um, yeah, Kieran sort of represents the, the emblem for toxic masculinity, or at least he sort of presents like that anyway. Um, you know, it's very macho and testosterone driven and, and, you know, act first and think later. But as, as the story sort of unfolds, we can see that he actually is a very empathetic person with a, with a, a very high emotional intelligence. Um, and yeah, and that's, you know, it's like a cool sort of unlikely depth to a jock, which is, it was really fun playing. I loved it intelligent he's uh, he's quick-witted um and interesting yeah interestingly as the series goes on i think we see there's a darker tendency to him as well and that was like really fun to explore and and um yeah as, as i kept getting the scripts it was like uh awful christmas uh, henry is an emo reclusive kid from chicago um he is very much to himself he likes to tune everything and everybody out with his noise canceling headphones he wears throughout the show. Um, he, he was a boy scout in his past life. So he is very smart. And a lot of the knowledge that, that he has, I think I feel becomes really helpful to the boys on the Island, even though majority of the time he says he tends to speak up at the wrong times, um, which can cause a lot of issues and, and problems, but yeah, you know, he's, he's the emo vibes of the group. 
Um, I would say that Raf uh, is a pretty quiet and sensitive, uh, gentle kid from Tijuana who goes to school in San Diego. Um, he's very much one that gravitates towards people that have far more um, conviction and enthusiasm and uh, are extroverted. And so kind of looks to them for guidance as to who he is and how he fits into the world around him, for sure. Josh is a neurotic, talkative uh panic attack prone stress head <laughs> he's a he's a he comes from a very wealthy family so um kind of being thrown into a plane crash and stranded on an island is quite a stressful experience for him yeah ivan is a uh playwright and an activist um with a very uh good understanding of online culture um but he's also got a lot of guards up and he's very defensive um just because of his identities and the way he feels that the world perceives him um so he steps onto the island already in an uncomfortable position um already uh, nervous about being around this many boys like that and um yeah he sort of has to break down and understand what vulnerability really means <laughs>